Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to The Upside. I'm Jonathan Oleski with JMOR, and this is our virtual show brought to you by the Associated Jewish Federation of Baltimore and JMOR Magazine to keep Jewish Baltimore informed during this time of uncertainty. If you have questions today for our guest, please be sure to ask them via the Zoom chat or via JMOR's Facebook page. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our wonderful host today, Beth Goldsmith, Chair of the Associated Jewish Federation of Baltimore. Dr. Scott Rifkin, publisher of JMOR, has the day off. Beth, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Jonathan. It's so good to see you. I want to welcome everyone back and Happy New Year to all. As we begin this new year, we find ourselves still in the grip of this pandemic, concerned about the long winter ahead of us. Sharing these challenging times through faith and spirituality can help us cope with the uncertainty while also offering us lessons on self-care. Research has actually shown that those who integrate positive religious coping methods into their everyday lives have much better outcomes than those who don't. So on today's Upside, we're gonna talk about ways that spirituality can make a difference in our emotional well-being. Jonathan, I'll let you introduce our guest. All right, I'm very excited to welcome Rabbi Joshua Grunberg, Senior Rabbi of Chizik Umino Congregation to our show to kick off 2021. Rabbi Grunberg joined Chizik in July 2018, where he previously served as Rabbi of Congregation Bethel in Yardley, Pennsylvania. Beth, I'll kick it back to you if you want to ask your rabbi the first question. And thank you. That was going to be the first thing I said. I'm so happy to welcome my rabbi, um, even though I'm farther away than usual at the, mom at the moment. But it's wonderful to see you. And thank you for being so flexible. Uh, some of you may remember we were going to talk about Hanukkah when Rabbi Grunberg was here last. But we get to talk about something perhaps even more important and helpful to our viewers today. So how does spirituality contribute to emotional well-being? So first of all, thank you for having me. It, um, when Jonathan asked me, I think my first response was, so wait, I don't understand the catch. You want me to hang out and talk with my friend Beth Goldsmith for a little while? Like, uh, uh, okay, like, where do I sign? I'll do that anytime. You know, I, I think to start with Beth, I, I think that one of the things that is so hard about the pandemic is that we are going through such an emotional roller coaster constantly. And we have to be able to hold all of these emotions in the same space because often they are such conflicting emotions. And in order to not only hold these emotions of loss, of fear, of anxiety, uh, but to get beyond them, to kind of figure out how we are going to get through them and even be okay and better on the other side, um, we have to find these moments of meaning that literally, Beth, lift our overall being, right? I mean, you can just think of a moment in your mind, whatever it might be, it could be a moment of nature, a moment of family, a moment of connecting with, with an old friend, whatever it might be. And after that moment, you feel physically lighter and you feel emotionally high. And that adds to your overall health in a very palpable way. I think the challenge is, and we can talk a little bit more about this, is that in the pandemic, we lose a lot of the spontaneous moments of spirituality because we are home, because we are not interacting with people randomly, right? I mean, I think about it, Beth, in the context of, five minutes in a kosher market in Pikesville on a Friday afternoon. You could probably see, Beth, enough people, right, to get some serious associated business done before Shabbos, right? 
But now we all have our masks on. It's get in and get out. So there's spontaneous interactions that really can be a spiritual interact. They're not I'm joking about the business side, right? But that can lift us and we're not having that. And that's really hard. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Jonathan, why don't you jump in? Yeah. You know, Rabbi, you know, so many of us now for what, almost 10, 11 months have been davening via Zoom. We go to synagogue online. This is how we're talking today. And, and, and many of us struggle. You know, we, we come to the synagogue or we came to the synagogue before COVID, lots of us to talk to God, to, to find God. How do we do that on a screen from home? Yeah. I mean, how do you do that? I've seen you davening online. You look just like you're davening in shul, but but what's the what do you have to do and what should we do to engage with God online? So it's, a, it, it's a great question, Jonathan, right? So I, I, I think first and foremost, we have to recreate those davening, those prayer, those blessing moments when we're at home to be as authentic as they possibly can be. So coming into the high holidays, for example, Jonathan, even though our congregation was going to be at home, we made the suggestions that they get dressed up for the holidays, right? We made the suggestion that if technologically they are okay with it on the Sabbath, that they get into a chat group so that they can talk about the rabbi's sermon following the rabbi's sermon, because everybody knows, right, Jonathan? That's one of the best parts of being there is talking about the rabbi's sermon, good, bad, otherwise. When we set up our high holiday platform, one of the most important things for us was that there would be a chat mechanism outside of the service so that people could ostensibly hang out in the hallway during services. Once, a couple of years ago, I got to go into the hallway during high holiday services. It's like a carnival out there. I mean, it is like the greatest show on earth in the hallways. But I'm joking, but I think, Jonathan, we have to recreate what moves us as much as possible. So if what moves us is getting dressed up and creating a sacred space around us, then do that, then dress up the room in which you are praying or use a virtual background from your synagogue, of your sanctuary, of your chapel, of a sacred space to you so that on some level, I know it's not the same thing, but on some level we're recreating it as authentic as possible. You know, I, I talked about this in my first answer. We have to be able to sort of hold the notion that it is not the same thing and once we can kind of accept that, then we can see meaning in what's next, right? So, for example, in pre-Zoom times, you went somewhere for synagogue on Saturday morning, and that was where you were. In Zoom times, and I know this is a rabbi saying this, but what a great opportunity to see different communities, Jonathan, and how they daven and, and you know, this is the time to to explore. And really, I think we have a lot of time to explore our spirituality. And so if it happens through prayer, I love the idea of just recreation as much as possible, right? Even if that means schmoozing, whatever it might be. But I think with all of it, our challenge is, Jonathan, that we have to be that much more purposeful about these experiences than we normally are, right? So we know in the non-Zoom pandemic world, synagogue davening, it's always there for us. We can check in, we can check out. Um, any kind of spiritual experiences, for some people it's yoga, for some people it's meditation, right? Any of those experiences, and they're available around the community, but you just have to be that much more purposeful about it, you know? And that's not easy. That That's our challenge and it's not an easy one. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I know Rabbi, I had shared this with you. Um, I, I, I'm just so, res what you're saying is so resonating that um, I actually on Rosh Hashanah walked to his Akamuna 
after morning services would be over so that I wasn't going to interact with people, you know, just the, the few people, you, um, that were going to be there at the building. But it was very special for me. I spent a long time walking around the building. I stood on the pathway in front where we have stones, you know, etched where people have made, and I connected to the people in my family whose, you know, memory sort of resides there for me. And um, it, it, it's just so perfect how you were talking about creating your own moment. It was very special for me, more so than even reciting any prayer. Right. And actually the, having that connection. And the crazy thing is, Beth, if you had been at services in the sanctuary, and don't get me wrong, you know, I love seeing you in services in the sanctuary, but if you had been in services in the sanctuary that morning, I don't think you would have had that same moment. You probably wouldn't have forced yourself or stopped yourself to have that same moment. And I think we're, we're seeing that, you know, I, I'll give you an example. You know, I, I have a lot of people who I have weekly meetings with in the building and their business meetings. And anybody who's ever been to Chizik and Muna, as you just described, we have this big, beautiful campus. And it took until the pandemic for me to realize that we can have these big, these meetings while we're walking around the grounds so that we get outside, we experience nature a little bit, we connect to that. I never did that before the pandemic, right? So I think we're learning these little spirituality nuggets almost of things, right? And, and maybe next year, Beth, God willing, will be in person for the high holidays. But that afternoon, you come back to Chizik Amuna when no one's around and you do that same walk because it was so meaningful to you and provided such a deep moment of spirituality that now it's a part of your practice. You know, Rabbi, could, could you kind of continue that, 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 that thought process? So you and I talked a little bit about this um, it, it is a lead up to today. Zoom has clearly changed how synagogues engage. Um, I, I don't know if I mentioned to you, I've been davening with the shul uh, up in New York, uh, Park Avenue Synagogue, they, one, wonderful Zoom services. I study with the rabbi there every week. So what will your synagogue do after everyone has the vaccine, God willing, you know, by summer, we'll have the opportunity to come back into our, our sanctuaries. How will Chizik Amuno be different and how will you and your synagogue be using technology? Yeah. To Such a great question, Jonathan. You know, um, I think about it in this context just to sort of begin. And that is to say that, uh, let me use this example. So um, we have a great family service at Chizik Amuna. It's under the direction of, of, um, of Rabbi Stuart Seltzer. And anybody's ever experienced this family service in any way, it, it, it's, um, I often get the statement that, you know, people say, you know, is there anything after the family service, like age-wise, or would you just have to go into the main service? And I always respond, no, no, I don't take offense to that. I don't want you to, anyway. <clears throat> Our students have huge parts in this family service. They read Torah, they take Aliyahs. And during the pandemic, their grandparents have been there for every single one of those moments. Now imagine the nachas, right, of a grandparent who is waking up, you know, at seven in the morning on Saturday morning to see their grandchild read Torah in Baltimore. That's an incredible feeling. I don't want to be the guy, Jonathan, that says to them after this is all over, sorry, you can no longer have that feeling because we're now off of Zoom. Too bad for you. So we have, even during this time, we've made an investment in technology and we will have to going forward because at the end of the day, it comes down to engagement, right? And... and in the synagogue business, we love, Beth knows this very well, we love to brag about how many member families we have. It's this great number that everybody talks about at rabbi conventions. Jonathan, I'll, I'll share this with you. It's sort of known that every rabbi exaggerates whatever their singer, synagogue membership is by at least 10%, if not more. But the real measure is how many people are we actively engaging? on a regular basis, right? And 
we have learned whether it's grandparents, whether it's people who go to Florida or warmer parts for the winter, whether it's people who've moved away from Baltimore, but because Baltimore connections run so deep and so strong that they wanna be a part of this community that's been a part of them for so long, we're really gonna have to blend these things. And you know, the difference between a Zoom and a live stream, people can engage on Zoom right? And they can offer blessings. So the first thing I think we're going to have to do is we're going to have to evolve technologically, right? Synagogues are all now going to have tech technology committees. They're going to have a IT person, right? Because it's not just this stuff, Jonathan and Beth. It's so much of what we do is, is through social media. You know, I'll say to my kids, I posted something on Facebook and they laugh at me. Because just by saying that I posted something on Facebook, I've dated myself into a certain generation, right? Because they don't even go on Facebook or on Instagram and Twitter. And, you know, and if we're going to engage, Jonathan, you know, I think the pandemic has brought this to the fore. But if we're going to engage that next community of Jewish, that next generation of Jewish families with their language on, on their platform, in a lot of ways, this pandemic is a wake up call to all of us in the Jewish institutional world that it's time for us to be 21st century institutions, right? That speak all of that language um, and that understand that engagement is more broad than it's ever been. And social media and those kinds of things are just other ways to engage i'll say this one last thing let's just say it on a completely other side of the spectrum we do a fair amount of evening adult education classes during the pandemic many of our um i'm going to say this very carefully many of our more life experienced members who prefer not to drive at night have been able to engage in these classes via zoom it is fair for them to say to us, Rabbi, we don't want to stop after the pandemic. Why can't we have a class that's both in person and on, and on Zoom? And they're right. And it's, it's our responsibility to adapt and evolve to that. Thank you very much. Beth? Yeah, that uh, I mean, everything you said is it, it's just so, so true um, as as one of those sort of life experienced people. Um, I don't I don't love going. Out. I mean, I say I get more done in any day now than I used to because I don't have to drive from place to place, from meeting to meeting. I when this is over, I click off and I can click right on to the next thing. And um, it's really really a wonderful thing. Well, and that's the other thing, Beth, is like gathering and meetings, right? And how that will evolve. And, and right, like, you know, I just think of in terms of the associated, we, we've been so successful at our associated synagogue partnership and at getting, you know, associated, right, executives and lead lay people, rabbis and synagogue presidents in a room at the same time. But that's like crossing the Red Sea. And if maybe, you know, some of those, you know, more meetings become Zoom, it's just, there's a lot of possibility there. Yeah, it, and, and we certainly are planning on having, a, and we can have a much bigger room without needing a room. So uh, that's, one of the, that's one of the beautiful things about it. And talking about bigger spaces, let's talk about Jewish values. There, there you go, there's, there's a home run in, your, in any ballpark for you. How, how can this pandemic, or how can J Jewish values, how can Tikkun Olam take on new meeting? How can we use our Jewish values to help us and to help others make it through? Yeah, so um, thank, it's such a beautiful question, Beth, because right at, at the end of the day, with everything going on, whether it's the JCC, Pearlstone, Chizik Amuna, Beth El, Beth Tefillah, Beth Israel, Baltimore Hebrew, right? At the end of the day, the value that we all place on the dignity of a human life 
it is ultimately sacrosanct and and we're all in that way in a um you know in a cooperative mission especially you know during this time so i i think beth you know i think that one of the great strengths of and i may surprise you by by what i'm about to say but i think one of the great strengths of the ultra orthodox jewish community is the way that they take care of their community the systems that they put in place that ensures that if somebody is in need that everybody comes their to their aid and, and in that way they really speak to the notion that in the jewish community we are only as strong as our weakest member or to say it a little bit differently we are only as strong as the softest voice in our community and so i think that covid as it does with so many things magnifies those soft voices in other words i think about people who in our communities need us the most during challenging times so people who live alone right because during this time it is so challenging um people who are away from grandchildren people who are away from parents right aging parents and i think that the first thing that we can do as a community is identify people in need and this is like we need to dial it back 40 years pick up the phone and call like on a very basic level so we started we're not unique in this way like at the beginning of this we started with like okay by next week we're going to call all of our people who have been alive for 90 plus years to check in and then we did it again at at, at um at, at rosh hashanah so i think first and foremost on a basic level beth human contact right now is just so important and we have to be so purposeful about something that in the Jewish community normally happens so naturally and organically, right? That human contact. So I, I think um, that that's number one. Number two is we support the, our biggest support now has to go to the organizations that are supporting people who are directly affected during this, right? So I think that, um you know whatever that means a and along those lines we we have to rise to the challenge when we're asked as organizations to help so i know right now both beth defilla and physic Imuna have drive through testing at certain times in their parking lots and you know it it um well it's not the easiest decision i know it's not the easiest decision um but we're saving lives and that's one of our core values. And I think, you know, Beth, during times like this, we are reminded of our core values and our core values in a good way become more narrow because we're reminded of what's important. So human contact, taking care of those people who most um, need taking care of um, and just the, the sort of, remembering people and their voices and that they need an avenue to be heard even if it's just for them to share their anxiety and so i think that you know our values of the dignity of each life our values of taking of most importantly right that reminder that happens in the torah constantly you know what it's like to be persecuted or in in egypt so now it's your responsibility so i i think these acts of goodness that reflect our values in the world are more important now than ever but i i think the beautiful part is that people are engaging so much i mean my kids just did the because you couldn't do the jvc volunteering day we got some packet of stuff and I just, you know, a couple of weeks ago, my wife and daughter were tie dyeing masks, right? So it's like there is a, are a lot of opportunities for us to just spread a little goodness in the world. And, and 
I think the effect is magnified in this time also. Super. So Rabbi, we have a Facebook question. Here's a, not that this is stump the rabbi, but here's a great biblical related question for you today. So I love from, this. Right, do I have a, do I get to call a lifeline if I don't? Uh... <laughs> of course you can. Of course you can. It's Zoom. Um, unfortunately, okay. unfortunately, the Krieger Schechter kids are in school right now because that's okay. probably where I'd go with my. Okay. This is an easy one. I'm, I'm just I'm just giving you the heads up. Okay, so this is from Bob on Facebook, and he said, "What did we learn after the temple was destroyed that we can employ today when we can't be in our synagogues?" It's a great question. So I, I mean, we learned so much when the temple was destroyed. I think. First and foremost, we learn that when we get in the Jewish community this deep edifice complex, it can become our great undoing, right? We sort of get fixated, Jonathan, on the notion that Judaism happens at its best in physical, centralized structures. I know there's an irony being that I'm the senior rabbi of Chizik Amuna as I'm saying this, but I think that we are learning in this pandemic, like we learned in, in the temple, by the way, Jews are notorious for needing to learn lessons over and over again before internalizing them, right? We're learning that so much meaningful Jewish life so much meaningful Jewish experience happens outside of the walls of the synagogue. And rather than as sort of institutional Jewish communities just simply saying, well, that's not our purview. Actually, what we need to be doing is opening up the walls of our institution and understanding, right, that like meaningful Jewish life just happens in so many places, right? So it happens on Zoom, but it, it also happens, you know, uh, outside in nature, or if you will, right now on a peloton when you're riding with a group of community members. So I, I think we are learning or breaking away from that 20, very 20th century notion that we had to build these big sprawling institute, physical institutions in order to pull people in and now a lot of times those physical edifices are actually obstacles for some people. Like that's sort of the symbol of what's intimidating to them. So I, it, it's, a, it's a great question because it's a repeat lesson. Um, but at least now, unlike Temple Times, we have the technology, which is just incredible to bring it all together, right? So like if I want to teach a class to Chizik members who don't live in the community anymore, and one's in Florida, one's in LA, and one is in Israel, they can bring everybody together into one communal space. Um, and we could do that before the pandemic. We just largely didn't try so much or didn't see it. And now we're going to see it. Oh, thank you. Great, great insights. Beth? So, uh, Rabbi, you've mentioned several ways that we can reach out to our, our community. Um, and um, I would just point out also that not just the weakest, I've had people comment on something I've said or done. I can't tell you how meaningful it is. So even those of us who, who may seem to be stronger yep. and, and who may seem to you know, have this all under our belts. That's um, a great point, Beth. Just, you know, I, I, it's been so meaningful to me, brought me to tears sometimes by a simple note that yeah. someone will write to me after an interaction. So I want to encourage everybody, you really do not realize the impact that you make on another person. Um, so that that was my, I'm going to get a little verklempt here, but uh, the other thing I want And I think it's so true, Beth, it, like, and, and now more than ever. Right, now more than ever. And once you realize that, like I'm very, very busy in my role as chair of the board of the Associated. And many people think that that challenge must be so daunting, particularly during these times. And I say, I feel like it was the greatest gift ever that I got this now because while other people are suffering, I feel like I'm thriving. I'm so busy. 
I, I feel so good about what I'm able to give back that it's really been an incredibly wonderful, I'm scared like everybody else to go anywhere. But that being said, I, I personally, spiritually, like the topic of our show today is my well-being has been unbelievably enhanced because of what I do. So along those same lines, maybe you could share with us some things that people have been reaching out to you for. Are there, are there new problems, different problems, uh, the kinds of things, you know, obviously with, mm -hmm. with all rabbi discreet, discretion, sorry. So, you know, I, I think to start with, I think there is a communal level of anxiety that is just around now. I, I, I think the best way to describe it is, and I apologize for this description, but as somebody who was a Ramah camper my whole life and now a Ramah parent, when your kids get home from sleepaway camp, there's a veneer of dirt that's on them that has sort of collected over seven and a half weeks. Yes, they shower while they're at camp, but, and, um, and there is this veneer of anxiety that is over everything. And I think it starts from this place, Beth, of understanding that this pandemic is finite, but it feeling like this great, big, infinite disaster right now. And, and that's just so hard. So I think um, everybody, even people who are normally not anxious people, who normally deal with this anxiety, the, the normal anxiety, the normative anxiety of life, and they just kind of let it go by the wayside, even people like that who aren't pre, sort of predestined to have anxiety, even they're feeling anxiety. So that's the first thing that we're seeing constantly. Then people have normal anxieties that they're dealing with regularly. And the pandemic seems to magnify all of that in a significant way, because what, you know, everybody just sort of um, you spend more time not active. And I think more time home. And so th there's just there's um, there's that sense. But I will tell you that for me as a rabbi and I know Rabbi Wexler um, one of our rabbis here at Chizik Amuna and I have talked about this a lot. Um, life cycles, particularly going through a, a loss, a death during COVID time um, is really challenging. Just really, and that we're seeing a lot of people who are going through loss during COVID um, and, and just not getting from the process what they need. And, and what's hard for us as rabbis is twofold. One, we know that normally the process really does give them what they need. And two, I, the best way to illustrate this is by story. I can't tell you how many times I've been at a funeral and I've reached my hand out to put an arm around somebody, to put an arm on somebody's shoulder, and then I have to pull myself back. So like we can't fully be the clergy that we want to be. So, so we're sort of participating in the, the lack of what they're getting. So that I think has really um, been a profound difficulty um, for people during this time. And then so much loneliness, Beth. I, I mean, just whether it's people who live alone um, you know, it's interesting, and obviously there's no sort of empirical evidence, but anecdotally, um, a lot of our people who I know live alone have really been engaging in classes and all of that stuff. They, they've been really making a point of it, but I think there are so many people who are hurting because they can't see their parents and they are deathly afraid Beth, that they're not going to see their parents again. And they're now going on a year where they haven't seen their parents in person. Um, and so it's this brush with your own mortality that's going on amongst all of this. And that's really 
where we're seeing so many hurting people. You know, Rabbi, kind of as we begin to wrap up, you know, and and, and I love the, the the answers, and 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 you know, being a rabbi is hard. I, being a rabbi during COVID, I'm sure, is much harder. And and, and I have some personal experience because my father's a retired conservative rabbi. So who takes care of you? Who's your rabbi? What do you do when you hit that wall? Because it's not easy. I you know, I wouldn't want to be a rabbi. And and thank you for all that you do. But but. How do you get through it? Yeah, so uh, thank you for asking that, Jonathan, for, for two reasons. One, because I really appreciate you asking me personally about it. But two, even more so, because I think it's so important that we model for the community that we are doing that. Self-care um, is really important. And I want to say that I am extremely lucky, Jonathan, to be the rabbi of a synagogue where they invest in my self-care, believe in my self-care, encourage me um, to take the time that I need. Um, so uh, first and foremost, um, physical activity is just so important. Um, we have a Peloton. We, we are one of those quarantine Peloton families who, who has um, gotten a Peloton. Um, so we, we, we ride the Peloton. Thank God for our dog, Jonathan, who I want to say by the end of every day kind of looks at us like no more walks. It's enough, everybody. We get that you're home all day. I'm done. Leave me alone. Um, I, I have a uh, both in Baltimore and colleagues out of Baltimore, I have great rabbi groups. Um, I have a wonderful, wonderful therapist in New York who's there for me when I when I need it. And my favorite, and I think hobbies are great, Jonathan. Um, and, and also, wait, before I tell you that, I, I work with a, a work coach who, who's first question for me every time we meet is, what are you doing to care for yourself? And I say that because I think we all need to create mechanism to make sure that we are caring for ourselves. Some people, Jonathan, are good at it naturally. Um, I'm not. So I need to have people who will remind me to take care of myself. Um, so during COVID, we bought um, a meat smoker. And one of my COVID hobbies, my only COVID hobby, has been smoking different kinds of meats and chicken. And, and um, it's really a win-win for everybody, Jonathan, because, wow. you know, so yes. Good for you. All right, Beth, as, as we begin to wrap up. Yeah, um, well, first of all, I, I will say how the, how the show started, which is what, how I was gonna end anyway, was to thank my rabbi, Rabbi Grunberg. It's, it's a, always a, pri a, a pleasure and certainly a privilege to be able to speak to you and thank you so much for being here. So as we're wrapping up, um, I'm just gonna ask you one last thing for our crowd. Um, are there any resources like books or particular sites, anything you would recommend um, for our viewers to be able to, you know, something that may help? Yeah, what a great question. So, um, so first of all, I, I am, I grew up in the Jewish, uh, the, the JCFS world, and I, I have always just been a huge Jewish child and family. Am I saying it right? I always, it always goes through different JFS, JCFS. Here, here, here it's now just called JCS, Jewish Community Services. That one. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, you it, know, wasn't I'm, one, it was once Jewish community, Jewish Family Services. It has, yes, but now it's JCS. We gotcha. Yeah. So, um, and I think that, um, you, you know, they have incredible, incredible resources. Um, I have been listening to podcasts during the pandemic, both podcasts that are frivolous and fun um, and podcasts that are, you know, a, about managing anxiety or, or managing getting through the the um, the pandemic. 
Uh, Priya Parker, who wrote The Art of Gathering, which is a book everybody in Jewish communal services should read, has some great podcasts on kind of finding meaning and pacing yourself during this pandemic, um, which I have um, really sort of enjoyed. Um, I also, I will say this, I really try to avoid reading the newspaper. I, I am a current events crazy, but I try to avoid reading coronavirus stories in the newspaper because it, they're all so all over the place um, that it like, it really, I found it weighing on me. It was like literally bringing me down. Um, and then I would give one other um suggestion which is not a book not a resource but um i have found during this pandemic that anything that i can do outside as opposed to inside has just been incredible just fresh air has really um just lifted my spirit and then you know the other thing i would say is that the last thing I'll say is we're so blessed in Baltimore, not only to have JCS, um, but there are so many incredible rabbis in the city of Baltimore and anybody who is hurting in any way, shape or form, reach out to one of these rabbis. They're just an incredible group who will be able to steer you in the right direction. If they don't know, they'll steer you. Um, to the right person. I, I'm in awe of my, of my colleagues and my partners here in Baltimore and, and how they have managed this, managed the community during this. So we're, we're so fortunate to have this incredible community and safety net in Baltimore. Um, we sometimes turn outward, Beth. I think especially in the Baltimore Jewish community, this is our time to turn inward and, and to just be comforted and lifted up by this incredible community. Thank you. Thanks so much. And thank you again for being here today. And thank you for reminding us of how wonderful our community is. And I'll recommend a few resources that I always close with. Um, you can visit associated.org and jmoreliving.com for always more information, more stories and resources, and also sign up for the weekly newsletter. I want to tell everybody out there, and please make sure you tell your friends, next Tuesday, January 12th, when we return, our show is going to be talking about COVID-19 vaccines. So I'm sure no one is going to want to miss that one. And um, again, thanks to everyone for being here today. Thanks to the wonderful Rabbi Groomberg. Thank and thank you, Jonathan, for co-hosting with me today. I really appreciate that. And from all of us here at the Associated and at Jay Moore, a little bit belated, but still very true wishes for a very happy and healthy new year. Until we meet again, please stay well. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you.